last week Sharon began uh, what we're going to have is a, a, so, a short series on change and she spoke about change always being with us and how we need to have a mindset that's ready for change you remember she talked about the little people and the little mice and remember that sniff who as soon as he recognized that things had changed he was shot straight off and we saw that scurry character who once he was really knew it was there he was ready and willing you know that the, the uh, trainers were around his neck and they were on his feet and he was gone ready to follow but then we met two little people and characters and they had to be persuaded that change was coming and we saw Hall who was took a while to understand that change was then laughed at himself when he saw that actually change was inevitable and what was neat with Hall was that when he began to change, he began to leave messages so that whoever followed would be able to come too. And then we saw Hem, and let's pray that none of us are like Hem. We are in a time of change like no other in our experience. And we just don't need to be people who say, well, I'm staying here. I know it'll all come all right in the end. We need to be people who are ready to hear and respond to what the Lord is saying. It's hard when we know there's something happening, but not really having the slightest clue about what that change is or what it's going to be, what it's going to look like. There's voices over here saying one thing. There's voices over here saying something else. And we can find ourselves being conflicted in this and, Actually, the Lord is saying, just listen to my voice. There's always going to be points of change. And today I want to talk about points of change. There's always a point where things change. That doesn't mean you've got to the destination. But unless you've gone through that point and recognized that point, you won't end up at the right destination. When a train leaves Chippenham, and heads toward Bath. There is a point, literally a set of points, on the way that can determine whether or not that train makes it to Ditch Bath or whether it comes to Melksham. That point is significant and it's fundamental that we recognize there are points in our lives and in the church there are points. In the lives of the disciples, there were points. And in the lives of Jesus, there were points. They weren't the conclusion of it, but they were the point. You can say everything changed at that moment. For Peter, the moment that he declared, Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. Everything changed. From there, we saw the transfiguration coming straight afterwards. And Peter was later to say that transfiguration is the point from which everything changed in my life. And today I want to begin this sort of mini series on the points of change in the New Testament church and see what they say to us. It's great history, but actually what matters is what they're saying to us. Everybody is saying we won't come out of this lockdown the same. But you know, when the temple curtain was torn in two, you can imagine how quickly they were to sew it back up again. It's going to be real easy to try and get things back into the way they were. But we want to be people saying, if this is change, let's follow what that change is. It may be uncomfortable. It may be tricky, maybe. But we want to see the principles that there are in Scripture about handling change and seeing change. And if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to uh, John chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. That's John, 21, uh, John 12, 21 through 28. And it says there that now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, said, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, 
and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. What a familiar passage that is, you know, it's one that you really dig into every every day, I'm sure. I can see the nods of people, so that's my favourite passage. No, oh well, perhaps those faces don't exactly display that this is, that. there's at least smiles at me suggesting it, so that's a start. I have to admit, when I read that passage this week, I saw something, or at least I didn't see something, that I thought I'd always seen before. When personally I've read that passage in my mind, or when I've thought about it, obviously not when I've read it because it's not there, but when you think about that passage, I always slip in Matthew 15, 24. I didn't come to the Gentiles, I came to the lost sheep of Israel. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus responds, and let's look at it again. Some Greeks have come to Philip, and Philip, obviously confused about what to do, because he then went to Andrew. Together they went to Jesus. Philip was unsure. Andrew was a bit braver. But they went to see Jesus, and they said, some Greeks want to see you. And the wild thing is, Jesus doesn't say, oh, yes. He doesn't say, oh, no. He says, and starting from verse 23, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Jesus actually never said, let them come, let not. He actually just went in. And I believe what I saw this week, that this was a signpost for Jesus. He saw at this moment that this was the time. Is there. In fact, what's incredible is that this little passage is the only thing we have in John's Gospel between the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday and the Last Supper. John saw this piece of information as so important that he slipped it in there. He made sure he remembered it. I'm sure lots of other things happened, but John said, this is what you've got to know. So John saw that this was incredibly important, that this was the point where Jesus set his face and said, I'm going to the cross. You know, Jesus has been to the Passover, probably been almost every year since he was 12. But this one was the moment of change. And in verse 27, he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. This is the third time that the voice has spoken to Jesus directly from heaven. Each other time, the first time was at the baptism. Jesus' ministry was beginning and the voice came, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The next time was at the transfiguration. Again, a turning point, a directive. And this third time is saying the cross is here. This is the moment. Now, I want to share a little bit about there's something significant about these Greeks coming to Jesus. Because Jesus is just going to say, unless a grain of sand falls into the ground and dies, it's not going to achieve anything. But if it dies, there's going to be a new harvest. And he knew that that death was his death. And by his death, the abundance, what had gone before was to die. But what was coming was a fresh new harvest. This was the sign of what was going on. And it was because the Greeks had come to him. So let's stop for a minute and just wonder what these Greeks were doing here. In Acts 6, if anyone remembers there, we read about a conflict that's going on in the early church. And that conflict was between the Hebrew widows 
and the Greek widows. And I begin to see that actually we've perhaps got a, a bit of a, a, a challenge in our thinking. Because what we've really got is believers who were Hebrew speaking, Jews who were Hebrew speaking, and we've also got Jews who were Greek speaking. And the two did not get on. There's lots of reasons for it. But in Acts, the ones who were the Greek speaking believers were being discriminated against. They were seeing as a lower class of people. And so it was in the Jewish groups. We've seen perhaps about the different groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but there were two distinct groups in the Jewish faith. And there was a phenomenal amount of friction between them. Throughout the Old Testament, there were times of exiles for the Jews. And the Jewish people had been spread all the way from Spain and Libya, through Italy, through Turkey, through Egypt, to Iran and down to Saudi Arabia. They'd been spread all over the place. And in that time, they had been assimilating much of the culture of their new countries. And because of that, their old language of Hebrew was no longer their main language. They became Greek speakers and they took in various things from their culture. And although they remained Jewish, there were very strict changes. In fact, a couple of hundred years before Jesus, the Greek speakers had actually taken the Hebrew script scriptures and translated it into Greek. There's a beautiful story about them taking 70 scribes and sending them into 70 rooms. And when they came out, they produced 70 identical copies of scripture in Greek. And so the Greek speaking Jews would follow and speak and read from Greek scriptures. This did not go down well with the Hebrew speakers. They felt that they were that, that they were so much better. So these two groups were far from friends, yet still the Greek speaking Jews would have to return to Jerusalem for Passover. And they were hearing about Jesus. Can you imagine? You've just come hundreds of miles and you've come into Jerusalem. And there is this man approaching and coming into Jerusalem. And everybody's waving their palm banners and saying, hey, this is the Messiah. These Greek speaking Jews were looked down on because they were not steeped in the culture and the, of the Hebrew speaking Jews. And because they had assimilated so much, they were classed as being almost unclean in lots of ways. We'll see this later on, or we, whether we do, but you can read it yourself. Because in Acts 21, Paul is arrested because he's taken some Greek-speaking believers, they said that he had, not that he did, into not just in the temple, but into the whole, into the inner court of the temple. I think our picture of the, the temple probably would help here, because the temple precinct was about the size of four and a half football fields. And at the center of it is the temple that we think of. And in there, there were various courts and you had to go through, and you had to go through ceremonial cleaning to be able to get in, the more clean you were, the further into the temple you could get. And the Greek believers and the Greek speaking Jews would find it very difficult to get in because they were often classed as being unclean. It was difficult for them because of their lifestyle and their assimilation of that lifestyle to actually make it in. Whereas the Jewish ones, because they were culturally so tight, they would find themselves having it much easier to enter into the courts. And Jesus is here, and all of a sudden, he's been met with a group of Greek-speaking Jews who are asking to see him. Why would this trigger the change that was about to him, that Jesus would say, this is the moment, this is time, I'm going for the cross. And I believe that in his mind, I just see the verses from 
Isaiah 43 verses 5 through 7 rushing in. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east. I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons and daughters from afar. Bring them from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by name, name, who I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Jesus saw that this was the moment, the coming back. And the Greek speaking Jews have said, we want to hear about Jesus too. We want to hear about the kingdom too. And Jesus knew that this was the sign that there was a change, that this was the change point. This was the point that decided which direction. And when he saw that, and when he responded to that, then a voice spoke from heaven. Jesus said in verse 23, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And at that point, the voice from heaven in 27 and 28 says, he said, my soul is troubled for what I, shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came for this hour. Father, glorify your name. And the voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. That's the third time that the Father in heaven spoke directly, audibly to Jesus, but that's recorded. And so as we look at that, I want us to grab hold of a very specific lesson about change. Change for Jesus was that he saw the sign of the hour. He immediately stepped into that new direction and then have the confirmation of that step. It's so easy for us to say, I'll wait until I've got the confirmation for the step. I'll wait until God speaks to me, do this. But in Isaiah 30, verse 21, it's actually maybe 22, it says, whenever you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I've always been caught by that verse because it's not saying, when you hear his voice saying, go to the right or the right, walk in it, he's saying, when you turn, then you'll hear my confirmation. When you step out in faith, I will confirm it. I will correct it or I will confirm it. And at this stage, things are changing. Things are changing in life, things are changing. It's going to take a long time before any kind of saying this is the new normal. But at this time, we need to be people saying, Lord, we hear what you're saying. We see the signs of the hour and we are stepping out and we know that you will confirm it. There are changes coming in our lives. There are changes coming in the church and we don't quite know where it is. But I believe we are at the change point. And we need to respond to that change point. For a train, if it ignores the point, it derails. And we don't want to be derailed as a church. We don't want to be derailed as individuals. And believing that this is the hour that we need to recognize the signs of the times. Those signs are clear. And step out into them, knowing that when we turn to the right or the left, he will lead us through.